we're here at EGU 2018 in Vienna. Um, my name is Keith Bevan and I'm here to interview Professor Mike Kirkby from the University of Leeds um, for our History of Hydrology project. Um, perhaps I could start just by saying, Mike, that it's always nice to see you here at EGU, especially now you've been an emeritus professor for what? 15 years About 15 so. years now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to see you, good, you coming back and, and um, like Jim do, used to do, um, encouraging some of the younger scientists uh, yes. around. Yes, yes. Well, certainly noticed how crowded it's been this year. Absolutely. I'm wondering whether that's them or me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, perhaps we can go back a bit to the very beginning of your career. Um, you did a degree in both maths and geography at Cambridge, um, yes. which must have been pretty unusual at the time, wasn't it? Well, it probably was, but the tripod, sy tripod system allows you to do right. more or less whatever you like. I mean, I'd, in school, I'd never done um, any geography at all. I think mm -hmm. uh, it was not, if you were a bright pupil, you were not discouraged from doing, to doing geography. Yes, so that's it true. never occurred to me. Yeah. So I did maths and physics. Mm -hmm. Um, so I came to Cambridge to do maths, mm -hmm. and um, if you've got a reasonable start on that, you can complete the uh, tripod requirements in two years, and at that point you're free to do what you like, really. Right. And when I was uh, doing my national service, which I was one of the late people to be caught by, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I met up with number of friends there who um, like walking and I'd never been to the Lake District or anywhere interesting like that before mm -hmm. um, and so I acquired an interest in landscape and fossil collecting and things of that kind so I wanted something that I could um, well that would use my interest in the environment really. Right. Yeah. Um, I looked at geology, but looked at how many fossils I'd have to learn, and was a bit daunted by that. <laughs> so I, and there was the possibility in the third year of just doing physical geography, right? Since I was also not particularly turned on by human geography, right? So this seemed the, the ideal combination. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly wasn't um, wasn't done consciously to think uh, that maths was just what geography needed at this point. I yep. think it was entirely serendipitous. Yep. <laughs> but um, the result of it, I happened to be in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's really. So I, I was I was free to do that third year geography right. on my own, and um, I don't. At the end of that, I looked for various jobs, and I was offered jobs doing things like operational research, which was using my mathematics. Yeah. But I was also offered a research studentship. Right. No contest. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 in, in the physical geography. Right? In physical geography, yes. So yes. This was about nineteen sixty, I guess you graduated. And yes. Then, um, I graduated first time in nineteen sixty. I was um, initially at Cambridge uh, for geography I was um, supervised by Vaughan Lewis, mm -hmm. but he went away on sabbatical and was killed in a car accident right. uh, about halfway through the year. So I then was Passed on to Dick Jolly. Right. <laughs> so that too was a degree of happenstance. In, in, indeed. Yeah. And, and yeah. So Dick was then your supervisor. Dick was then my supervisor. And I think PhD. I was one of his, I'm not sure if I was his first, but one of his early research students right. anyway, because okay. he hadn't been at Cambridge that long either. Mm -hmm. He'd been uh, at Oxford doing, um, being a lecturer in meteorology, I think, before mm -hmm. came, coming to Cambridge. And, uh, well, he, in, and others, of course, but he, in particular, infused us with all the recent American literature, you know, this was yep. late, six, late 50s, early 60s, 60s yeah. Leopold and Maddock and things of yeah. this kind, yep. and, um, and that got me fired up. I mean, I'm not, looking back on it, I think it was really uh, valuable that I knew absolutely nothing about the subject beforehand. <laughs> So I was able to come to this with a fairly you know, right. clean mental slate. So how, how did the project um, get, well, I, get developed in, in that comment? Well, the PhD project, I thought I'd do something on rivers. Mm -hmm. And I went to look at um, hydraulics, Wallingford, and all these places where they were doing rivers, and thought that really couldn't compete with 
at least the hardware side of it, and mm. it seemed, although I don't know why I thought this at the time, that it, you know, it had all been done sort of thing. So I, I then reverted to studying soil creep. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure why, but uh, <laughs> it seemed something that, uh, you know, because it's defined as being imperceptible, that no one has really looked at before <laughs> in great detail. So I spent a lot of um, interesting summers going up to the southern uplands. I remember once I had a, a, a lampretter. Mm -hmm. and it was so piled up with stuff and until I sat on the front it would tip up backward you know? <laughs> and, and then later I got an old um, and pretty broken down old van and we um, once uh, went up there with Dick Chorley and we had to stop and push it several times whenever it stopped <laughs> and um, it wasn't very nice weather I know we had to spend an afternoon in air buying him a sweater because <laughs> it was pretty unpleasant up there, but um, yeah. I'm not sure he did visit all his research students' field sites. Well, I guess that's quite possible. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> um, but, well, that was an interesting thing to do. I tried to measure soil creep. I'm not sure if I was successful even now. Um, well, but I seem to remember that on field trips, with various groups of undergraduates, soil creep pits were, Absolutely, were yes. installed. Yes. Um, have, have, so have some of them been revisited? Some of them, but yeah. not as many as they should have been. I think <laughs> the answer to that. If, if you could find them again. Now, yes, well, yes, yes, yes. yes. The, the challenge, you know, um, this was before GPS and things like this. Yeah. Yeah. So to find a yeah, site, you use, it was more like a treasure hunt yeah. than like a, a surveying operation to find these things. You know, you had to just basically remember where they were. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, with, with various markers. But uh, well, I, I certainly found some on my, my PhD and found them again. And we had these um, bars just stuck, a, stuck, it was called a tea peg, I think, stuck in the ground. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the soil would shear and so the top of it would go faster than the bottom and it would get mm -hmm. developed and tilt. And we had an accurate little bubble on the top that would try and measure this tilt. Mm -hmm. Of course, how much was due to soil creep and how much was due to passing sheep, <laughs> I'll never know. <laughs> but it was... Uh, like that. that. That's a topic that no doubt will come up by generation by generation as, uh, as uh, people look at uh, small scale to large scale processes. That's right, yes, yeah. yes. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure if, I mean, you know, there have been such dramatic changes in how you can monitor things no, of this absolutely. kind, but actually it doesn't really work no quite on the scale yet. Yeah. Um, so it's. So uh, that, that, mm. I mean, that's a relatively small hill scope. Processes, but you did move up to looking at the larger evolution of hill slopes. Was, was that also part of the PhD, or did that come later? No, well, there was some of that in the PhD. I mean, um, all, all the literature on creep suggested that it was um, proportional to slope gradient, yeah. and so it behaved like a diffusion process. So, you know, at this point, my math kicked in, and you could, well, then seem natural to put that into a slope evolution context you know and if you leave a slope long enough it will turn into a um, a cosine curve or a parabola according to what assumptions you make mm -hmm. um, and I don't I can't remember I think I'd done quite a bit of this before I found uh, Ted Culling's work which mm -hmm. actually preceded this yeah um, but you know following him and following um, it was Castle and Yeager, the Conduction of Heat in Solids, yep. was the key book the analytical solutions. that had all the solutions yes. and the analytical the diffusion frame yes. problems you wanted. Yes, yes. so you, you could see what would happen under a range of um, you know boundary and initial conditions. So that that was good, and I did actually um, write my first computer program there, but it was a matter of. Um, not just punch cards, but punch tape. Mm -hmm. So if you made a mistake, you had to punch the whole lot again. Well, I was very grateful that I came off yes. the year of punch <laughs> tape, I have to say. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I think, uh, you know, it was something you would spend about five minutes on a PC doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it was just to prove I could, I think, rather than mm -hmm. make a useful contribution. But it was just, if you like, confirming that the series solutions and the computational solutions were compatible I think mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah so yes so I did did start off with some um, uh, some slope evolution at that, at that stage I think and what uh, was the was the link made back to the Horton 1945 surface runoff type evolution 
Was, was this uh, was this is something to do to try and do the subsurface? No, I don't okay. think so. Yeah, I'm mean, not at that stage. Um, uh, of course, Horton's uh, forty-five paper was one I read, but I was reading it more. I suppose with regard to the stream network, application yeah. ratios and things yeah. Yeah. later, and I think we're probably more turned on by the um, Leopold and his group's work and um, Stan Sham and mm -hmm. uh, um, John Hack mm -hmm. and their, yeah. their work. Yeah. So a lot, of the, a lot of the US work that was going on at this, yeah. at this type of stage. So perhaps that's a good point to bring in the fact that um, you then had a period in the state. Yeah. So how did, how did that come about? Well, I think Dick Chorley arranged it, mm -hmm. you know, as a as a postdoc, and um, spent a year working for Lynn Leopold in Washington with mm -hmm. the USGS, and then uh, um, my first wife then was doing a PhD at Johns Hopkins at the same time, and so I then spent a year working on Basement Run, which is now an LTER and all right. that sort yes. of thing. Yep. Um, uh, I, a year after Asher Schick had been doing it for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's, that's the type of linkages we need to. Well, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm not sure. I learned a lot during that year, although I'm not sure I can put any really um, uh, concrete markers down. I mm. think that came out of that. It's, it's seeing um, how other people went, work. went to my first uh, big meeting, AAG meeting, I think. Mm -hmm. okay paper about the soil group I'd been working on previously. <laughs> um, so that actually gave me my first publication. That, you know, that it, I finished my PhD in 1963, the first paper came out in 1967. You know, mm -hmm. this is the pace at which things moved in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I didn't even feel bad about that, I think. And there, there was a period of the Smithsonian as well, is that, is um, that right? Or? Well, uh, as a result of that, uh, I don't know, we were approached by some archaeologists at um, University of Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, Ann Arbor, and they wanted um, they wanted someone to go and, if you like, do the environment in the Oaxaca Valley in Mexico. All right. And uh, so we spent about, so that was, I guess we came back for about three months to U UK and then went out from sort of January to June of the following year, and spent spent all the time down. Drove down a jeep, I think it was, from Washington down to work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that was um, an interesting experience. But uh, um, and say, my wife was doing her PhD down there as well on sort of land use changes, and you know, I was trying to understand things in terms of. Really, it was uh, aggradation and degradation of floodplains, and changing the amount of availability of water for farming, and you know, where the where the farmland was in different areas. Still, still a current problem, I think. So it's still a current problem. Yes, yes, and you know, over um, well, we had probably two or three thousand years of record essentially mm. uh, over that period with several alternations of that kind, and yeah. you could see the archaeological sites, and of course, it also affects where the archaeological sites are preserved mm. because if they've been alleviated over then mm. you just, just see the odd artifact that manages yeah. to crawl its way back to the surface yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but not otherwise um, but well there was some fluvial geomorphology in there if you like but I don't still wasn't really anything to do with hydrology as I would now understand it I think um, and then after that uh, oh and we we spent um, a month on uh, Montague Island off the Alaska coast. There was a, 90, a big earthquake in 1964 off the coast of, Alang uh, coast of Alaska, and um, uh, this island went up about 40 feet, I think. So we thought it'd be a good place to go and look at raised beaches. <laughs> Indeed, <yeah. laughs> so we spent about a month camping on this uninhabited island <laughs> with, um, well, my wife, a guy from Princeton, his name I can't remember, and Tom Dunn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, uh, again, no hydrology involved, as far as I could yeah, tell. Yeah. Um, and then we came back to Cambridge, and I think I was replacing David Stoddard or something while he was on sabbatical doing some teaching for him. And it was in that period that Dick said, oh, I've been reading this stuff about, um, it was uh, Hewlett and Hibbert, you know, um, yeah. subsurface forest, flow in forests and things. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it'd be an interesting thing to look at. 
And so that was really the first time I got involved with hydrology at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, co-wrote a, a, a chapter in this Water, Earth and Man mm -hmm. compendium that Dick put together. Yeah. Um, and really got interested in that. And mm -hmm. then I carried that interest to Bristol, where I went in 67, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, first time I had a chance to have a research student, that was Daryl Wayman. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, we have to measure this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, put in these through flow pits and things. And, 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 but I'd also, from the work in Basement Run, inherited the idea that it was a really good idea to focus on a catchment and get a lot of people working in one catchment rather yeah. than everyone has their own site. Yeah. So I think, you know, we tried, we got three or four research students going in into that. This was East Twin yeah. area. Mm -hmm. And that, that was good. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the message that came out of that was the very clear observation that at least to a first approximation in the small catchment, runoff is the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was thinking about that, I think, that led to an entirely theoretical um, exploration, which was top model. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which it was, was topographic uh, index. Yes, the topographic index. But, but the idea that if you, if you made the assumption that runoff was the same everywhere, um, that had a lot of quite clear and fairly constrained implications, yes. which actually created a coherent model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, well, I think this is, um, you know, that was written, in f published, in fact, after, the, after I came to Leeds in 1973. Although mm. I'm, I'm sure that I saw a map of topographic index in the University of Bristol Geography Department, oh. special publication, series B or something, but we've never managed to track that down. You I may be I'm, right, but I haven't got a copy of it either. No, no, no. We, even even yes. the librarian at Bristol, I tried to yes, find yes. out, from, and they, they didn't have a copy either, so, but I'm, my memory says that I, I saw it there sometime. But, uh, yes, but I... I I think if we did that, that was before it was formulated as top model, yeah. if you like. Oh, Sunday, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So it came yeah. Later. yeah. Um, I mean, Cambridge and Bristol were at the forefront of the so-called quantitative revolution in geography then, and the, um, especially on yeah. the human side, if you like, but, but there was still, there was also a feeling of amongst physical geographers to go out and measure everything everywhere. Um, yes, I, I mean, I, how was that working? I, I mean, obviously Dick Chorley had a foot in both camps, you know, he was yes. involved in the Mapping Lectures and things like that with, with Peter Haggard. Um, so they, they formed a duo, but I, I suppose I think the sort of if it moves measure it yes. uh, school of thought was probably more inspired by the Americans yes, again. Yeah, yeah rather than through uh, a direct sort of infusion from that direction, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, although, obviously, you know, it, the feeling that everything had to be quantitative was obviously something that was in the air and the, in the water. <laughs> yeah. um, so it was hard, hard to avoid, I think, yes. Mm. yes. Um, yeah. I, I was going to mention at that point that you, you did invite me to stay on and do a PhD with you in Bristol. Yes. When I graduated Indeed. there. Yes, and I was but, disappointed that you didn't. You went to East Anglia, well, didn't but you? But at the same time, you did recommend that I should go elsewhere to yes. get more experience and, and more opinions from other people. And, and um, I just wanted to say that that's advice that I've given to students over the years as well, because I, it did me yeah. um, a well of good, and uh, I think it's useful. I think, yes, I think it's good general advice, don't we? Yes, certainly, yes, yes. And you've certainly benefited from it. <laughs> <laughs> But, so so uh, we've got up as far as, as moving to Leeds now, which was 1973. Three. Yeah, I came to Leeds, yes. And, and you were appointed at the same time as Alan Wilson in, uh, in a year or two later. Actually. A year or two later. Yes. But you were yes. both in your yes. mid 30s, which that's right, was, yes. was 
quite Jeremy unusual. Young, yes, to be still, appointed as professor in, in the UK in the 1970s. Well, that's so, right. There were less professors around at that time. Yes. Yeah, very much. So, yes. <laughs> but um, I don't know. As far as I was concerned, um, while we've been in America, we had actually been up to Toronto, mm -hmm. where Bill Birch, who became the head of the department at Leeds, was the head of the department, and he offered. Uh, in fact, myself and my wife both a job, which we turned down because we decided we would come back to Britain rather than become uh, permanent migrants. Um, so you know, he knew he knew us right. um, bef before that. Um, so I think that think that helped, and I you know I think he did, appointed Alan, and obviously that had been a great success. success. Yes, and so he um, thought this was probably a, a pattern to follow, and I mm. hope it worked out. Well, you've been there ever since, <laughs> despite having to yeah. uh, be head of department at least three times, I yes. think, in that period. Yes. It was only, only three years since then, yeah. but uh, yeah. still quite a lot. I suppose in nine years, in 40 isn't too bad, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. But, uh, and, yes, I, for, I mean, over a number of cycles, Alan and I just alternated it. Basically, everyone else said, you're paid to do it, you do it. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, after, you know, after, after Alan became vice chancellor, then I think we decided it had to be opened out a bit more than that. Mm -hmm. I refused to do it yet again, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it became a bit more interesting. But um, but you're coming to um, Leeds, to Leeds yes. really, uh, you know, cemented top, top model, and I I yeah. think um, although I'm. Suppose I would claim that the original idea was mine. Absolutely, I, yeah. I think we, we um, need to get that into the record. Definitely. Well, okay, because I get asked the origins of it. But you know, without your um, deeper research and proselytization of it over the years, I think it would have just fizzled, probably. Mm, possibly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, look, looking at ideas I've developed, I think I'm, I'm not saying top top model is you know, one of the very best of those. But the quality of the ideas and the acceptance are almost <laughs> uncorrelated, I think, you know. And the fact of um, supporting it and championing it is a really vital role, I think. And, you know, without that, it would not be where it is today. Well, there's, I guess there's an element of technological development there as well, because when we first started out, all the topographic analysis had to be done by hand. But even so, it was possible. Now, now everybody and his dog has got of course. a topographic map, yes. a DTM, DEM, and you just click mm -hmm. on the screen and um, it goes away and does the, the analysis for you. So I think that's partly been uh, that that's, to do with it. That's eased it, but I mean... Even without all that, it was possible to analyze the topography mm -hmm. in a way that you couldn't analyze the soil moisture or anything else and still find it difficult to do. Yes. You know, so so that using the surface expression was was um, was really critical, I think. Um, yeah, even if it's now much easier to do, it was still e still possible then, instead mm -hmm. of most of the other things one would want to measure being impossible, I think. <laughs> um at Leeds, you also, and a bit before Leeds, you, you started to produce a series of, of books and edited, edited books. I think the first one was with Mike Carson, um, wasn't it? That or, was actually done with Cambridge Press. That was done with um, Cambridge um, Press. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I... Was he already in New Zealand at, at that No, no, he, no. he was a research student at, at Cambridge. Right, okay. Also with Dick Chorley, um, I think. Um, and we just happened to be there at the time. I, I was coming back after being in America, I think. And I, I, I had a, a uh, fellowship for a couple of years mm -hmm. for people coming back from America or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I think that uh, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And we were both interested in slope processes. So we, we said, you know, let, let's write a book on it. You know, there's this book called About Fluvial Geomorphology written by Leopold Woman and Mal. Yeah. Miller, let's do the same, let's do the same thing for slow tomorrow. Well, it's just, it's just a very nice summary, but well, it is a very nice summary of, of that body of work up to that time. The community mm -hmm. must have been fairly small, the people working in that. 
Yes, um, yes, it was particularly on the analytical yes. side for the for the landscape for that was was there much contact between people in in different places like um, Frank Arnott, for example, in Germany was doing some work at that time. I I knew of Frank Arnott mm. because he was in Maryland, University of Maryland, <laughs> when we were I was in Johns Hopkins, <laughs> but I'm not sure I ever met him at that point. I mean, I knew of his work, you know, knew what he'd done. Um, so only met him later, but mm. I mean, uh, yes. Um, I don't. Uh, the, the forum where those things were being discussed, I think, was partly the British German Morphological Research Group. It was just getting going at that yes. time. Yes. Yeah. And um, even more, one of the series of uh, IGU commissions on mm -hmm. uh, geomorphic processes. Mm -hmm. um, Good morning. That's yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. And that had a community like um, Tom Dunn, later Bill Dietrich. Um, uh, Frank Arnott, uh, Jan de Play, mm -hmm. Jan Pusen, um, and there was a, a group that frequently went to these meetings. I mean, I remember there was a meeting in Israel in 1974, mm -hmm. um, Aaron Yair, obviously, people from, the, uh, from Israel as well, and Asher Sheik. Um, and that actually provided the most exciting forum, I think, of yeah. all, because it was, you know, all the Getting people who were together, at, yes. at cutting edge. Yeah. Um, so that and the communities were smaller. Yeah, they were to be said. They were smaller. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But you know, to, to to get out in the field with these people and see things explained and discussed in the field in the context was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A really eye opening. I think. But you also, I mean, we we talked yeah. about top model, but the, the sort of hydrological interests that led at least to producing the book on hill slope hydrology as well, which has also been very important for a lot of people, I think. Uh, yes, I think so, yes. I mean, I think I th that uh, that was published by Wiley, mm -hmm. um, and I think there was then a series of books yeah. um, under my broad editorship. Yes. I think the next one was about soil erosion with uh, Roy Morgan, I think. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, but there were a series of old ones, and there was one we wrote, did together on the yes. channel network mm -hmm. function, yeah. which didn't quite take off in quite the same way as Hill Slope Hy Hydrology, no. which rather to my disappointment, <laughs> I thought it was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the way with these things. I think some things take off and others don't. It took a while, didn't it, Hill Slope Hydrology? I, I sort of remember you having to finish off a couple of chapters yourself that other people were... Uh, well, there was a chapter to... by Wipke, who did the original That's fruit bird trough, yeah, yeah. and that, you know, he, he wrote something, and then we tried to, to revise it, and we had comments <laughs> from various people, and he never replied again. So in the end, I just wrote it for him. Right. Well, <laughs> best I could anyway. <laughs> You know, it wasn't wasn't a very long chapter, but it was obviously important to get these three yeah. drops in there. Yeah. Um, so everyone else did their stuff. Good. <laughs> um, yes, and of course that has been in, in extremely influential, I think. And um, I'm not sure. I don't think it's still in. But it was reprinted, I think, at some point. And translated into. It's been very, translated very into simple. Russian and Japanese, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> Chinese, I think. Maybe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. The solar oh, one was translated into Spanish, but it was done in Mexico. So all the Spanish <laughs> always laugh at it. <laughs> but I uh, don't think any of the others had such success. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and after that, um, uh, I know you've been involved in a lot of um, EU projects of various types, um, particularly working in Spain and, and the Mediterranean areas, but um, you yeah. also try to integrating processes at small scale up into larger scale type predictions. How, uh, what's the sort of development process been there? I don't know. Well, two, two strands, I think. One is I became more interested in sort of land evolution models, mm -hmm. yeah. um, not as fancy as the ones today. I think uh, I, Started off mainly working with soil profiles and doing them on a programmable calculator, you know. And, uh, I was going to bring that up actually because I, <laughs> I, I remember visiting you once in, in Headingley and you were 
quite excited to show me your Podsol profile that, That's right, uh, yes. that have been developing on the television screen in the living room, driven by an Atari well, 600 or something. 400, I think, 400 yes. programmable cartridges. That's right, and yes. They have been running for days and days yes. and days. I think it had 16K RAM, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but before that, I was using a programmable calculator okay, as well. Yeah, so one of the first was... HPs, I think, wasn't it? That's right, yes. Um, and I, I was actually never that in much in the forefront of using the best available computers, I think, mm. um, and didn't really get going on it until uh, personal computers were fairly Much more freely available. Yeah, fairly reasonable. Yes, um, but but I was uh, looking at landscape evolution models, yes, including soil profile models, but you know also trying to put in similar simple forms that you could put into a landscape evolution model more or less all the processes, mm. you know, um, soil erosion processes first of all, as well as soil creep, and then um, uh, started trying to put in landslides, and, and in looking at those, trying to look at um, the travel distance idea. Rather. I was looking at uh, landscape evolution models, both to incorporate lots of processes, but also to start making the process descriptions more explicitly dependent on climate. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so that you could say if you, you know, ran the model for different areas with different climates, you'd start to see different slope evolution. Mm -hmm. And that obviously makes, makes good sense, although obviously one doesn't always know the climatic history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And didn't, didn't then. Um, I think one area that I got very excited about, I think, was all the stuff that uh, Bill Dietrich and others was doing about hill slopes and hollows, mm -hmm. yeah. and how that affected drainage density. Um, I think before the most best data on that was stuff that Mark Melton did in, that, in the 1950s, mm -hmm. and really what he showed is that drainage density was very strongly dependent on climate, mm -hmm. Um, but what Dietrich and that group was showing was that it also depended on gradient. And I was trying to tease out, and I'm not sure if I've ever fully succeeded in teasing out, to what extent it was one, one traded up against the other. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I also, around that time, I think it was in the 19, about 1986, in fact, originally, um, after a spell of being head of the department, I had a research uh, assistant called Dick Neal, who um, we tried to carry this idea of um, getting the processes in terms of climate more generalised, and we're looking at you know um, well trying to do it on a globe on a scale that would work globally, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, this was pre uh, system science models, of course. Didn't oh, indeed, in yes, days, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, um, but it, but it, it wasn't so easy to try and put those into a, a long-term landscape evolution model, mm -hmm. but at least to look at how erosion rates should vary around the world and mm -hmm. compare this with things like what people like uh, Milliman and Savitsky and people like that were doing yeah. um, from a very different point of view. Um, and, and that thread actually um, led on to papers finally written about um, 10 years ago, I think, um, this Pacera model that we've developed, yeah. Yeah. which um, and that had run through a, um, a dedicated EU project on the, on the subject, but, you know, try, trying to, to tie this down. It was principally for soil erosion, but actually at the core of it, it was a water balance model. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was trying to do the same thing that the SPAT does, but not using any energy inputs, using a potential of evapotranspiration mm -hmm. as the energy input, essentially. Yeah. And so the whole the core of it was very much a water balance model, and it had elements of um, Horton in it, it had elements of top model in it, mm -hmm. it, various things, you know, but trying to do it. And, you know, the model we finished up with was sort of dealing with kilometer squares, so we applied it to the whole of Europe, which is like, you know, 10 million square kilometers or something of that order. Um, so each cell had to be more or less independent of the others. And so it was trying to see what would come off the slopes rather than what would come down the rivers, mm -hmm. delivering, mm -hmm. delivering things to the rivers. 
and, uh, and that I think is probably the other model that's had longest legs in terms of survival, although yeah. it's not been taken up on anything like the scale of, of, um, of top model. And uh, although again, it, I said it incorporates parts of top yeah. model. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's uh, I think been a very interesting journey and. Um, the, all the EU models, um, well, we've taken students to Spain on field weeks mm -hmm. uh, since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So I knew Spain quite well, and uh, I was delighted to get involved when John Thorne started up the various desertification projects, yeah. uh, the medalist projects that ran from about 1990, uh, ran in recognisable medalist forms for about 10 years, I think. So there was a successful run of projects. And I, in that, I, I tried to develop a series of models. I started off with really fine scale models, and then slightly coarser scale sort of sub catchment models, and then finished up back with this very coarse scale Pacera model. You know, each time with a fine scale model, I was realizing there was no way we were ever going to get in the data that you needed to run the model, you know? <laughs> um, and no one would ever apply it. So it's been an interesting sort of coming back from the fine scale to a much coarser scale approach, mm. which actually has some utility. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's being, uh, I think, uh, Norway uses as their soil erosion uh, advice model these right. days. So right. it's, it's, okay. it's yeah. been reasonably successful, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, um, well, that's probably been the thing that's take, taken most of my time for the last 10 or 15 years, although yeah. it's not the only direction I'm still interested in. Yeah. It's uh, one of them, I think. But um, I, I find it very difficult to get away from top model. And I, I don't <laughs> know. Oh, there's reasons for that. There's very good reasons for that, yes. yes. And, and, and the, the key basic reason assumption. is, well, at a certain level, it's a good set of assumptions, but it's also so simple mm -hmm. that it's very easy to incorporate and embed it in other more complicated models. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, you've, you've also or, embedded or it in lots, models. Yes, lot, or mm -hmm. to do it lots and lots of times in, in some of the uncertainty work that is developed from that as well. Indeed, yes. Yeah. I've left that to you more than to me, I must say. <laughs> um, my, my, my approach, I think, has always been um, to try and go for the process. Yeah. And you've always been... Uh, more concerned with getting it right, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and, and those, you know, I think there's, there's validity in both those approaches. I think yeah. if you go too much for the uncertainty, that's slightly pessimistic. Absolutely. Perhaps. Absolutely. If you go for the process, you've always not got it right. <laughs> so there's uh, there's benefits in both sides. I think. Um, I wanted to mention that you know, your contributions to hydrology and geomorphology have been widely recognised, including the, with a number of awards, including the Dalton um, from EGU in 2008, but uh, um, others from the Royal Geographical Society and from the BGRG and, and, and so on. Um, have any of those been particularly special to you? Um. Well, I don't hang them on my wall, if that's what you mean. <laughs> um, but yes, of course, one appreciates being being yeah. recognised. You know, I, th I think um, you know, I very much enjoy what I do and continue to do. Um, but if one had no recognition for that, it would actually be a much more emptier. You know, just the recognition of one colleague's not uh, these formal recognitions. Yes, there are. Yes, a plus mark if you like. Yes. But I don't. I, I think the the, the day to day recognition, of the feeling you still um, can talk on equal terms with at least some of your colleagues who haven't gone miles ahead of you, <laughs> um, is you know is is the most satisfying part yes. of continuing to work in the field. In, in, I think, and I, I, I think I would very much agree with that as well. I and mean, it is some of those collaborations and, yeah. and interconnections that are so important. Um, and that we, we're trying to actually reveal and, and, and record, in fact, in some of these interviews. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what about the future? <laughs> I don't know. I, I found being... Not necessarily only for you, but for, yeah. for in terms of okay. important problems. Yeah. And, uh, well, for me first, I mean, I think I found being retired um, 
one has to re-justify oneself to some extent. Mm-hmm. You know, why should you be this old guy doing it instead of some young person? You know, and you know, my view of science is that directing science by by a lot of greybeards who are telling us what we should be doing is absolutely the wrong way to do it. You know, science is essentially anarchic; it's bottom up. Um, you know, so uh, you know. I have some hesitation in putting myself forward as still doing something useful, given given that point of view. Um, but I enjoy doing it. It's my hobby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, being retired is like being on study leave all the time. I think, <laughs> in some ways, although you say you, you still have to have to justify yourself, I yeah. think, and yeah. that that's a slightly slightly interesting. I don't know the things I'm still interested in. Well, I'm still interested in top model. Going into other things, I think um, I've been uh, involved just recently in this uh, um, cost action on connectivity, mm-hmm. and trying to you know think how to incorporate elements of this, how places are, uh, how uh, locations are structurally connected to each other, into how that affects the way in which landscape evolution. Uh, models work, and of course, it has to be a landscape evolution model because until you move some dirt, you haven't changed the structure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I think um, a lot of um, a lot of the work in this area um, sort of doesn't really take that on board. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they yeah, think they can get away with the runoff, and that that yeah. is everything that matters. Yeah. Um, um, which which I, is why I've always stuck to the short term, of course. But uh. well, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's, but it, it's interesting to see how it works in the longer term. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I've uh, recently gone back and got a paper in press about soil profile modelling, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've um, tried to um, what well, we've tried to develop top model in one or two ways. We've done what I call a distributed top model, which is not what you call a distributed mm-hmm. top model, but is like one meter cells and mm-hmm. trying to solve it individually, but yeah. also. Um, most explicitly trying to root the overland flow more explicitly, mm-hmm. I think, and that, that has been quite fruitful with a, a research student. Um, and I've gone back to um, analysing re- recession curves, you know, to derive the parameters of top model. Mm-hmm. Um, As we did in the... Yes, absolutely. The wrong calibration of version published in 1984. That's right, right, yes. yes. But, but come back to it with thoughts about how the properties of the topsoil affect the flood response yeah. and you know natural flood management and all those issues that are hot topics at the moment. So yes. I think thinking about that as well. Um, so and the other the other thing is trying tried and this is slightly hybridized I think trying to put top model on top of a peat mm-hmm. to treat the leakage into the catatelm as another loss, like evapotranspiration, mm-hmm. and letting top model decide how the, the dynamics of the aquatome. Well, that's been quite fun as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we can conclude by saying that you're not going to be short of things to work on. No, of course. see over for the future. I think there's plenty to do still, so, yes, and uh, plenty of things that interest me, and occasionally I can interest other people in them as well, and that's nice. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mike. It's been fantastic. Thank you. It's yeah. been nice to, really interesting to talk. Good. Thank you.